I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to return. Um, and let me also just say that it's uh, been a great uh, pleasure of mine, uh, in addition to teaching at the University of North Carolina, to be part of the team at the National Constitution Center. So I want to be able to extend to all of you a good hearty welcome from them as well. Um, it's wonderful to have a robust, vigorous First Amendment discussion, uh, which is, of course, not just of concern to you, but all of us um, who care about the Constitution. Um, I, I have the honor, of course, also being able to share the stage with an extraordinary lawyer. It's not possible to have a great First Amendment without great First Amendment lawyers. And as Daniel Patrick Moynihan described you, um, called Mr. Abrams the most significant First Amendment lawyer of our age. Uh, in addition to his new book, um, he also has litigated some of the most important cases in the First Amendment in its history. So I want to take you back to one of those cases, if I sure. may. The Pentagon Papers case may be a good place to begin. Your role in it, and why is it still important? <clears throat> I was 31, 34 years old then, just the day before yesterday. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I got a chance to be sort of co-counsel. Professor Alexander Bickel from Yale Law School argued the Pentagon Papers case for the New York Times, but I'd been a student of his, and we did work together on the case. They, they, the case arose during the war in Vietnam uh, at a time when, uh, as happened uh, a lot in those years, the war was going badly. Uh, there didn't seem to be any easy way out or to win uh, in the way we usually define winning. Um, and uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, decided that it would be a good idea to do a study of how we got into the war. Now, you might think that you would do that study before you got into the war, <laughs> but in any event, Experts were put together. They looked at Department of Defense documents, including very highly classified ones, and they came out with a 22, 23 volume study of how going way back to the end of World War II through 1968, when the Pentagon Papers ended, the US became involved uh, in Vietnam in the first place. Uh, now, by the time the New York Times was given uh, access to that, as I said, the war was going badly. One of the authors of the Pentagon Papers, a man named Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who had come uh, initially uh, to be in favor of the war, had turned against it, believed the public ought to find out uh, how we got in and uh, the, the level of duplicity within the U.S. government in advising the public about what was going on and why we were there. He made it available to the New York Times. They started publishing articles after studying it for three months uh, in secret, interviewing former CIA, State Department, Defense Department people to check it out. And they started doing stories. The Nixon administration was in office then, and they went to court to cease to stop publication uh, of documents, uh, some of which were uh, uh, potentially at least sensitive, all of which were labeled as top secret. Um, and that's how the case began. Uh, uh, it was a series of uh, lucky breaks for me that I became involved uh, in the case. Just one the briefest description. The Times that had lawyers who represented them for over 60 years. Uh, who believed that the Times should not publish it, and who were contacted by the Nixon administration asking them not to become involved in the case. And so on the very night that uh, the Attorney General of the United States, uh, John Mitchell, sent a telegram to the Times saying, uh, stop publishing this material, the Times found themselves with their lawyers telling them that they would not represent them. Yeah. And so the Times found themselves in the middle of the night, as one author later, later said, like a vicar found in a house of ill repute <laughs> at midnight without a lawyer. 
and by purest chance, that day, that lunch, that day, Professor Bickle and I had spoken to media lawyers about a different case involving confidential sources that we were working on. Uh, and we spoke with all the freedom, uh, self-assuredness, and ignorance uh, of lawyers who don't have a client. And we were asked, <laughs> what would happen if the government went to court? And we said, well, yeah, this is America. Come on. We, we don't have prior restraints on news coverage. They'll, they won't go to court. Wrong about that. Uh, and if they do go to court, no problem. We didn't know that their lawyers, external lawyers, who'd been studying it for a long time, had told them they would lose, that they would violate the espionage law, that they would lose their television licenses, that the publisher would go to jail. Uh, but uh, in the free and easy way of lawyers with nothing to lose, we gave them the perfect answer. And when they had no lawyer at midnight, they called. Hmm. So what, from your point of view, what was most surprising about the Supreme Court decision in, in, in this case? Well, the basic decision was the government had not met its heavy burden of demonstrating that there would really be substantial harm to the public uh, and irreparable harm to the, uh, to the public. I guess looking back on it, certainly, what surprises me most is that the government had persuaded a significant majority of the court that there would be harm, real harm. Maybe not enough harm to justify a court order, but real harm. And uh, 10 years later, I was asked by the Times to write a magazine article for them, going back to the witnesses in the case and asking them, particularly the government witnesses, did anything bad happen? Was, was there harm? Hmm. And there was none. There was some embarrassment because there were countries, Australia, Canada, for example, trying to help us end the war by negotiations. And some of that came out, although not in any detail. But there was no military harm, no national security harm. But what does surprise me, even now looking back, was that the government, on a very paltry record, did persuade a majority of the court that there would be real harm. And yet, of course, the, the, we have the famous decision that comes, uh, comes down against prior restraints there. Um, we unfortunately don't have time to go through all the wonderful cases, incredible cases um, you've been a part of. But what other case do you think is most significant that you have um, litigated over the, the years? Well, uh, certainly the case that is most recent and most controversial decided by the Supreme Court that I was involved in was the Citizens United case, uh, a case very unpopular in most of the political circles that I'm in, but which I thought raised very, very serious First Amendment issues. You recall what that was about was basically a movie that a conservative uh, group put together about Hillary Clinton when it looked like she would be the Democratic nominee for president in 2008. Uh, Senator Obama, of course, wound up being nominated uh, and winning. But so that, that they, they prepared a sort of documentary. You could call it a, a hit job, a really tough and, I think, unfair, but nonetheless powerful denunciation uh, of then Senator Clinton because that organization received some money from corporations, the argument was made that it violated the uh, law for, for it to be uh, on the air because the McCain-Feingold law made it illegal for a, uh, any money that had gone from the treasury of a corporation uh, into something which was on television, cable or satellite within 60 days of an election or 30 days of a primary was illegal. And the idea there was, as you can imagine, uh, to try to get money out of politics or some money 
out of politics. But the effect of it was that, that a political attack, uh, which I would add a, a note by saying that which the First Amendment protects most, a political attack on a candidate for president would be criminal if put on television. I thought that violated the First Amendment uh, and uh, I represented Senator McConnell in that case, uh, which did decide uh, that uh, the law was unconstitutional and that corporations like individuals could spend their money not in contributions to candidates, which are treated differently in the law, but spend it by buying ads, by putting it into other entities that buy ads uh, as much as they wanted. And that is the law now. Well, as you know, one of the most common criticisms, I guess, you hear about the Citizens United decision is it has just sort of spawned dark money and all sorts of, just a flow of money uh, that inundates the process, and the critics would say corrupts the process. Mm -hmm. Do you, what's well, your response to yeah. that? The first is that uh, one of the little known parts of that decision uh, is a ruling that the, the, the part of the law, the McCain-Feingold law, that, that required more disclosure of who was giving money or what was giving money was constitutional by an eight to one vote. Only Justice Thomas dissented uh, on that. Uh, we have a dark money problem. In my view, the answer is more disclosure. Congress won't pass a law involving more disclosure. Uh, the Internal Revenue Service won't change its rulings about how to treat certain uh, uh, expenditures of money. Uh, uh, and the like, but uh, I really think it's just a bad rap on Citizens United saying that it has anything to do with dark money. The answer to dark money is to make the money light. Well, let's um, go to at least one more case. That was um, a case that you think was really important but is not appreciated, a case that is overlooked as being important that you helped, that you helped litigate. Well, uh, you know, not every case lawyers do is in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, here's one, a case in California in which uh, a 16-year-old uh, who listened to some very dark uh, music, very popular at the time, uh, committed suicide. Uh, his mother sued, saying uh, that uh, the a broadcaster who put it on the radio at that time uh, on, on which he heard it and the people who sold the music was responsible for the suicide and therefore could be held liable. Mm. Uh, it was very appealing on one level. Uh, the boy was dead, there's no doubt. He was deeply into music which could be said on the broadest level to encourage the darkest view of the human spirit uh, and therefore perhaps had some influence. But we argued uh, successfully in the California courts that that simply couldn't be the basis uh, for a finding of liability uh, on the people that put it on the radio, the people that put it out for sale or the like, that it was uh, simply a form of protected speech and that uh, uh, that's not what the First Amendment allowed. And we won, uh, and in part because we won that case, there weren't many more cases like that, but it seemed for a while as if there would be. Well, another case I know that you think is important, but perhaps not as appreciated as it should be, is the Brooklyn Museum case. Tell us about that case. Yeah, that, that, that's a case in which uh, Mayor Giuliani of New York City, uh, uh, now better known as the president's sometime lawyer or publicist, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, 
Mary Jo Leone was deeply offended, deeply offended by an art exhibition that the Brooklyn Museum uh, was offering to the public. A lot of the museums in New York City, at least, are partially funded by the city, and that included and includes the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, the mayor announced that he was going to cut off all funding of the Brooklyn Museum and purported to do so. Later, as the case proceeded, uh, uh, he basically tried to throw them out of their city-owned uh, museum. Uh, and it was a case which raised uh, some difficult and some not so difficult uh, issues. One is funding. I mean, cities are allowed to make decisions about funding. No one would deny that a city museum could decide to have uh, only representational art uh, or only art uh, uh, about the city for their funding. But this was a situation where it, the mayor's view was that it was sacrilegious for a particular painting called Black Madonna, uh, which, which showed a uh, Nigerian woman who was a Nigerian English artist uh, who did it uh, uh, with elephant dung, which is used in Nigeria for uh, glitter. Uh, uh, with elephant dung on the picture itself. His view was, at least he said his view was, that that was sacrilegious. Well, when you start talking about sacrilegious, you're running into the First Amendment uh, uh, directly. We don't have a notion of a sacrilegious exemption to the First Amendment. Uh, uh, there are lots of things you can do, but uh, you know, a lot of protests are obviously completely consistent with the First Amendment for people who were offended. But to, to cut off funding raised very serious First Amendment issues. Uh, and we did prevail uh, in that case. Uh, it was a case in which uh, a high-ranking official from the city was obliged to answer the question, uh, what standards does the city apply as to what works of art are acceptable. And he wound up saying, I don't think anything ought to be in a public museum which my seven-year-old daughter shouldn't see. That will not exactly pass First Amendment muster, right. uh, and it did not. Well, thank you. Uh, we, uh, if you want more time with Mr. Abrams, he's got several terrific books. Um, this is the problem with limited time, but we have a real precious gem here. Floyd Abrams, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.